Destination Freedom. Station WMAQ presents Destination Freedom, dramatizations of the great democratic traditions of the Negro people, a part of the pageant of history and of America's own Destination Freedom. Today we tell the story of the author of the bestseller, Knock on Any Door, in a chapter entitled, Mike Rex. I don't know on what door I first knocked to find how the wheels of society can turn against a guy and grind him into what they call a menace. Maybe it began when I discovered I was a Negro, would have to live in Jim Crow towns below and above the Mason-Dixon. I've been knocking about for a long time in juke joints, cheap diners, flea bag hotels, and gospel missions. In the twilight alley where jack rollers, hobos, and con men lived. I had the habit of putting down what they said on paper. Best way to strong arm a square is to flip his arm behind his back and give him the half Nelson. Like this? <laughs> yeah, you know Motley missed your calling. You make a better burglar than a writer. You sure missed your calling. You see, when you're shooting a forty-five. You put your hand solid on the trigger, and you sort of squeeze the handle. That's it. <laughs> Keeps you from missing. Now you put the pea between your fingers, and you let the suckers pick up the shells till times get better. It's the old shell game, Jack. Highly educational. I got my education for the stories I had to write. And one year, when the knock of a boy named Mike kept echoing in my head, I went up to a door to rent a room in the heart of the slums. When you knock my door, knock soft. Maybe I'll mistake you for a gentleman. I'm sorry. Huh. You're a Negro. What do you want? I'd like to rent the place up over your shop. How'd you know there was a place up there? Can I look at it? Won't do you no good unless you got your references. Say, who sent you? Where are you from? I never laid eyes on you. I followed him upstairs. The place was thick with dead dust and live roaches. And he opened the door on 40 feet of unbroken gap. But still, he asked. Who told you this place was vacant, anyhow? Mike. Rex. Mike. I don't want no more gunmen. Nobody Mike lived here. Mike told me. Oh. Well, uh, then you must have been right close to him. He was a good kid. I always said so. All kids are good. Do I get the place? Uh, you're mighty anxious to rent Mike's place. Why? Uh, he and I... Is sort of started out together. I mean, he went one way, and I went the other. We shared things. Oh, and then you know where he put the stuff he stole. What stuff? Oh, don't play dumb. Cop said he left 50 grand somewhere. Lord, I have looked under every board in this place. Can't find a thing. Now, he couldn't have spent it. Where'd he put it? I wouldn't know, landlord. You tell me, and we'll split 50-50. That's all I ask. I need a place to work and live. I only want his Story? Story? I'm a writer. Writer. <laughs> well, come in. As long as you don't write no poetry. I can't stand no poet. This won't be poetry. Just a short story. <laughs> if you're writing about this neighborhood, it'll take a long story. This ain't no overnight job. I'm no overnight writer. Well... How about it? If you find the loot. 50-50? 50-50. And it's your casket, son. Move in. Uh... I'll take the rent in advance. He took the rent. I took the place. I made a home out of the bare rooms, and when it was done, I put my typewriter on the table, overlooking the brick and steel jungles of the street below. I fingered the keys of my typewriter and started my search for the loot. I started thinking of all the doors I had knocked on and where they led. I thought of the year I had rode with a friend across the country in an old jalopy, jobless, hungry, broke, and headed for California. And of the day we rode through a Wyoming town and the gas ran out. Hey, these things wrong, Martin. Well, you know as well as I do. Gassed up two states back. Look, face it, we are stuck. Uh, this is a terrible place to be stuck in. 
For a small town, it's got the biggest slum I've ever seen. Yeah. Think we can get a job here? Well, we got to, to get gas to go on. Unless we can borrow some. Let's look for the job first. On a Sunday? Hey, time for mass, too. Look at the church. Come on, let's look for gas. This town's got a law against vagrants. In church, it hasn't. Let's get converted. We went over to the church and sat quietly in a pew. It was there I saw Mike. Here they come, Maydales. That's the sound I call some ma'am. They're going to non stanker. Abominating for a dollar so erome. Why to as sales for his... He was an altar boy. With gems in his eyes as he knelt beside the priest. As if he were already in heaven. He was clean and fresh and young. And after mass, the priest told me his name was Mike Rex. Yes, Mike's the best child in my parish, son. Everyone notices him. He seems intent on becoming a priest himself, though I tell him he's deciding too early, much too early. The next day, when I walked the streets of the town with a big slum, I heard Mike's war cry. Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door. All hid? No. no. Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door. I got up, let them in, hit me in the head with a rolling pin. All hid? No. Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door. All hid? Hey, hey, which way they go, mister? <laughs> Ain't no fair telling, is it? Nah, I guess not. Hey, I never seen you around here before. Oh, where are you from? Chicago. I saw you. Where? In church. Hey, you see what I was wearing? Yeah, you looked good. That's the way I want to look. Father James says if I keep on till New Year's, he's going to ask Dad to help me get a bike. I'd sure like to have a bike. Wouldn't you? Sure, I would. I ain't waiting for it to drop out of the sky. Either. You're it. Lefty, you're caught. Sure, sure. How about this bike? You and me got the same idea. Thought you were too scary to get one. Oh, I ain't scary. Then do what the good book says. Seek and ye shall find, Mike. You're talking about stealing. Stealing? Where'd you get them bad sounding <laughs> words, Alter Boy? Borrowing's what I'm talking about. Borrowing. B O R R O W I N. I left Mike puzzled over the two words. And my own friend had a few words of advice. The longer we stay, the more the cops will trail us. What's wrong with my solution? I didn't know you had any. The most honorable. What's that? Borrowing. You mean... Yeah, it. yeah. Seek and ye shall find. We went about the town looking for a lender. We knocked on the generous door of a garage... Silence invited us in. Ain't a soul in there. Yeah. Except maybe a car or two. Okay. The door's not locked. Oh, come on. Roll it back. Okay. Push. That's it. <laughs> well, well, well. A brand new Cadillac. <laughs> Somebody's sure looking out for us. Yeah. Look, I'll, I'll unscrew the gas can. Yeah. Hey, pull that bucket over now, and I'll siphon okay. you. Hey, here's the hose. Okay. Who owns this car? <laughs> I wonder what he'll look like when he steps over to start tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing won't start. <laughs> All right, boys, you won't have to wait till tomorrow. Put up your hands. But look, mister, we... Call me sheriff. Sure come. That's my car. You're under arrest. And the judge was ready with his decision. For vagrancy, burglary, day trespassing on private property, garage breaking, larceny, and willful mischief, I sentence you, Willard Motley, and Johnny Locus to 30 days in the county jail. 30 days. Next case. Next. I got to know the insides of the jail. 
I marched in the chow lines, a rebellion rising in my bones. And the urge to strike back at the people who had put me there swept over me. What'd you do to get in here, Motley, eh? Huh? Lost. What you gonna do when you get out? I don't know. I know a town in Utah that's just begging to be burglarized. Begging. I don't know. You will know. Two or three more trips to this jail and you'll know. Hide right down back there, will you? Obey the rules and you'll get out. There's a man you'll stay in. Now pay right down. I obeyed. I smothered my rebellion. I walked out again into the air and sunlight and passed a reform school fence, and there I saw my altar boy. Mike was raking leaves. I leaned against the fence until he raised his head. And Mike, Mike! Now? What are you doing in there? I stole a bike. I didn't intend to keep it. I'm not an altar boy anymore. Where's your mother? Home, I guess. Have you seen her? Not, not since the day in court when they... Well, how'd you like to see her? I sent for but She won't come. You'll send me. You'll go? Sure, sure. Well, what do you want me to tell her? I ain't gonna cause no more trouble. Tell her to come and see me. I won't bother no more bikes. You tell her. I left Mike with a rake and leaves. I went across the town to knock on another door. Who do you want to see? You? You don't know me, Stram. I know a kid who's in reform school. So? I'm looking for his mother. What's he to you? What's he to you? Trouble. Nothing but trouble since the stork dropped him. Is he yours? So I'm told. He wants to see you. <laughs> He's pretty lonesome. You got me weak. He needs help. The help. you can do. Here I am paying rent too high to keep one human going, let alone two. And he wants help. Who's going to help me send him to school? Or give him what a kid's got to have? Or make him go straight when he sees there ain't no profit in going straight? Who's going to help? Maybe, maybe his father His could... father. Yeah. Go and tell his father. Where will I find him? Try the pool hall. The tavern. Or maybe the county jail. I tried them all. And I found him in the pool hall. I waited while he mastered the most difficult shot in the center pocket. A ball in the center pocket. Uh, bank shot. <laughs> when you start them off right, they'll sure go straight. <laughs> Try the nine. Uh, you Mr. Rex. Uh, yeah. There's a kid named Mike in the form school. My Mike? That's my understanding. Well, 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 what do you know? What do you know? I, I think if you go over and, and talk to him... Yeah, sure, sure. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Ted. Uh, what's up? Yeah. Listen to this, will you? Mike's gone, get pinched. Oh, no. Chip up your block. His mother won't go to see him. Uh, well, he's that just like Helen, ain't it? And he needs talking to you. Sure, sure. What's he in for? He stole a bike. Stole a bike? It could have happened to anyone. A kid of mine stealing a bike? Why, of all the good-for-nothing, trifling, stupid kids, I... If you I just go over and talk to him... I'll talk to him. Soon as I finish this game. Nine ball in the corner pocket. <laughs> Hit them right and they'll sure go straight. They sure will. And that evening, when I stopped by the reform to say goodbye to Mike, he was still in the yard with Rake in the leaves. Some of his shyness was gone. Hello, Chicago. Hi, Mike. Mike, I... I saw your mother. She'd come if she could, but... Well, you know, things aren't easy with her either. Yeah, I know. You understand? Sure, sure. Pop explained it. He was here this morning. He was pretty burned up about the... Bike, huh? He was so mad. He said I should have tried for a truck. Mike raked up the dry leaves and set them afire. And the fire in Mike was set off too. 
And he troubled my mind and notebook for five worried years. Until I passed through his town again and I knocked on his mother's door. What do you want? I was just passing through the city. Thought I'd say hello to Mike. You got the wrong address again. Is he in the reform school? He's graduated. The county jail. Why? He jackrolled a drunk. You back here again. I was passing through and I... Looking for Mike? Well, he's not at the county jail this time. I checked. Of course he's not. He's a growing boy. What happened? Grand Larceny got him in the state pen. He's a growing boy. I stopped by the state pen. They brought out a boy who had Mike's face and his form. That was all I recognized. You want to see me, mister? Yeah. Uh huh? Don't you remember me? Naturally. You're Chicago. I'd still like to help you. I'd like to get to Chicago. And they tell me... Kid. Mr. Kid, you're, you're running up a blind alley. Quit the rackets. You come to preach a sermon? I can do for myself. You're not doing so good. Up to now, all you've Up done... to now, I've been in a two-by-four town. I'm due for a break in Chicago. Look, take it easy, kid. Try to walk straight, folks. Try to walk straight, he says. I'm hip. I ain't got a chance no more. They got my number marked down on a grave. Walk straight. Out there, they just wait till you stumble. Walk straight. They put barbed wire in your way and they tell you, walk straight, don't stumble. They trip you up and down and jump on you with both feet. If you're a Negro, a Jew, or a Mexican, they double the barbed wire. And they say, walk straight. Look, kid, if you... I've looked. Let me get out, so. What are you going to do? Jack, live fast. Die young. Leave a good-looking corpse. He left and disappeared in the cell blocks. And when he got out, I, I watched for him in the pool rooms, bars, and alleys of West Madison. But I hoped I'd, I'd never see him. And in the juke joints and the Twilight Tavern... I found I wasn't the only one who had Mike on his mind. The trigger men heard about him, wanted to hear more. Welcome home, Motley. Welcome home. Trigger? Yeah, old Trigger. <laughs> now, what about this kid I hear you adopted out west? What kid? Oh, cut it out, will you? They say you've been putting his boots on and lacing them up on how to live in the big city. You got me wrong, mister. I got you right. I like to know a kid who knocks over highway trucks like he does. He's got no ain't he? In a way. <laughs> Old, quiet, motley. Talking only with the typewriter, huh? <laughs> Listen, I need a guy like Rex. Yeah? Well, his address, state pin. Oh, that's temporary, chum. Strictly temporary. One of these days, he'll get out, and when he blows in, looking for honest work, tell him about Trigger, will you? <laughs> Tell him about old trick. And the grapevine kept watch over Mike's move and his rep grew. Have you heard from your young friend Mike Rex Motley? Mugger? Yeah, remember how I showed you that half Nelson? Yeah, sure, sure. Have one good time deserves another. About this Rex kid. I need a buddy since the cops picked up. Well, I need a guy like Rex. What do you know about him? He's just a kid. Give him a chance. All I know is what I read in the papers, chum. He's out of the pen. Parole. When he comes to shy, tell him about me. Let the good times roll. Yeah, the kid's coming this way. Tell him to look me up, will you? Remember me, Motley? I need a kid with nerve. Yeah, one good turn deserves another, tape ready. One good turn deserves another. Tell him about me. Tell him about old Trigger. Right about I turned yeah. down all the I applicants. I wanted to keep Mike as far from Chicago as I could. I never knocked on Mike's door again. It was Mike who knocked on my door. Yeah? I'm looking for a bird named Motley. Well, I'm the bird... Mike! Yeah. C come on in. Come and sit down, kid. It's good to see sure, you. Sure, sure, Jack. Sure. But uh, I didn't come to waste your time. 
I'm looking for a, for a job. What kind? Okay. Talk like a square. But they say you know every mob in the neighborhood. I I know a lot of people. Tell them I'm a good worker. I carry my own tools, see? 45. Can handle a Tommy, too. Look, Mike. All I'm asking is for a tip-off. All right, put down that rod and I'll give it to you. You get out of town with that stuff. You'll finger it, kid. You'll shoot somebody someday and the whole state will be down on you. Against that, you haven't got a chance. I'll make my chance. You're bucking the state law. State law? <laughs> Jack, all my life I've been bucking state law. Since the day I was born black in Alabama, found they had state laws against me. What's the state done for me? They feed me when I was hungry. When I was lost, where'd they lead me? When I was without a job, what did they offer me? Barbed wires. And I tripped. Okay, so I tripped. So this time I'm just up in the price of tripping me. See you, Jack. Where you going? Going up over the store up there, ain't that Garrett? Yeah? Then, live fast, die young, leave a good-looking corpse. That was the last time Mike knocked on my door. But he went out knocking on other doors with his forty-five, on taverns and gas stations, factories and currency exchanges. And one night, he tripped on the barbed wire, and he upped his price. The newspapers told about it. Domine Jesus Christi per tuam sanctus simon agoni meteorationem qua rasti pro nobis in mente alueti awando. Quando factus... Got those electrodes set, Joe? No, I can't tighten this one. Well, hurry, they're waiting on us. I can't help it. That light blinds me. I can't see so good. Hurry up. Watch it. That electrode slip. Watch it. Say, can't you squares get me ready for the chair without fidgeting? What's the matter, you nervous? Snap it on, Jack. Snap it on. They snapped it on. They looked at their watches. They gave a signal. They counted off the seconds. And in the cell, in the cranium of Mike Rex, he too was coming, just as he had done when he was an altar boy. Last night, night before, 24 hours at my door, all hid. No! Last night, night before, 24 robbers at my door, all hid. Last night, night. Four, twenty-four robbers at my door, all hid. Amen. I guess he left a good-looking corpse. once, Mike, I put down on paper. I finished eight years after I'd started, and the landlord wondered. You ain't found none of the loot Mike might have left up there, huh? I found it. What? All behind the doors. I knocked on the doors and found the human fowls that grew in the slums. I'm still knocking. <laughs> just heard Destination Freedom's dramatization of the story of Willard Motley, author of Knock on Any Door. Now we are pleased to present a message from Willard Motley. In many ways, juvenile delinquency shares the same fate that Mark Twain noticed about the weather. 
much talked about, but nothing done about. In the old days, the same penal method that applied to adults was applied to children. When the child broke the law, he was sent to prison like his elders. And there he became more familiar with the trade of crime and graduated to a more proficient craftsman. Nowadays, when you look at the records of delinquents who improve upon their first misdeed, the fact that we have not yet even touched the deeper causes of delinquency, either adult or juvenile, becomes apparent to the most naive. The numerous contributing causes for the creation of boys like Mike Rex has been listed by social workers and statisticians. I'm neither. I'm a writer. I'm interested mainly in discovering and reporting the things that men feel and think and talk about. And I can say from my interviews with teenagers that one of the unreported causes for crime is the lawlessness they notice among so-called respected peoples. The fantastic insecurity in the lives of both adults and juveniles must be reckoned with in order to understand the Mike Rexes we read about in the paper and to understand who they are really imitating. What kind of insecurity is it that breeds crime? Economic insecurity? Partly. But the insecurity that comes from false charges, false race theories, false arrests, false propaganda, plays as much a part in juvenile and adult delinquency as does poor housing and bad health conditions. Restricting freedom in the name of defending it Building national security on guns and planes rather than on social welfare is as sure a factor in upping the crime rate as unemployment. We writers feel that the American child is a peculiarly sensitive individual. How can a child, Negro or white, have much respect for law and order when he hears that Isaiah Nixon, a Negro farmer, was shot and killed in Georgia less than three months ago because he dared to vote, and his admitted killer was set free. How can they mean respect for law and order when one out of every ten Americans, the 15 million Negroes of the United States, are denied the basic constitutional guarantees of equality of opportunity in face of grave concern for freedoms overseas. The fight to end community crimes can be accomplished only when the fight to end more basic crimes against democratic rights are carried out. We writers feel that the Bill of Rights is not merely a document to be hauled about on a train and exhibited when people are being pilloried for their opinions, but is really an outline which, if followed, can eliminate many of the real crimes of the day. The great words of the Declaration of Independence, declaring that all men are created free and equal, call for the realistic treatment of the character and dignity of the human personality, regardless of race, color, or creed. This creed begins the real fight against delinquency, adult and juvenile. And until then, Delinquency shares the same fate as Mark Twain's weather. Much talked about, but nothing done about. Destination Freedom is written by Richard Durham and produced under the direction of Bob Womble. The role of Willard Motley was played by Fred Pinkert and that of Mike Rex by Oscar Brown. Others in the cast were Claire Baum... Frank Dane, Mrs. Kingslow, Tony Parrish, and George Kluge. The special music was composed by Emil Soderstrom and played by Elwin Owen and Maurice Lachon. This is Hugh Downs inviting you to be with us again next week when Destination Freedom will bring you the story of Oscar Dupree.